Hopefully, to warfare in the Greco-Persian age is the latest installment in the Great Battles of History system by GMT. Uh, this is a system that has been around for quite a while now and it exists in two forms. One is the full uh, form, the full version, which is pretty complex and not something for the beginner gamer or for the casual gamer. Uh, it requires some investment both in learning the system and then in I would say making the system work. The logistics and the length of the system are such that you need to be somebody who loves your game into be able to find the experience rewarding. Uh, there's also a simpler version which is called appropriately enough a simple great battles of history and that is the version that I played in the past. That is a version that allows you to uh, play some of the games in the series uh, um, using a simpler more streamlined system of rules and it also uh, cuts down on, on play time. As I was reading the manual for this uh, for this game here, I read that after this set of rules makes changes on on the previous installments and makes the game more accessible. So it is it's somewhere in between. It is more complex than Great Battles of History, but also less complex than previous full games in the system. So I thought that this could be uh, the good game for me to make the transition uh, to go from the simpler version to the full version. So I played some of the battles in this uh, in this set here and I played them using the uh, full system as described here. So I think in general if you play the simpler version of the game in the past and you would like to try uh, the full system this could be a very good uh, entryway for that. Definitely this has been the entry for me. Yes, uh, the complexity increases considerably when compared to the uh, simple version, but not so much so that a season war gamer would find it particularly hard to make the transition. Anyhow, let me tell you a little bit more about the set. To play the game you choose one of the many available scenarios in the scenario book and as you can see here there really is a large range of scenarios that you can play and uh, you have a map for the scenario, the historical description, setup instructions, special rules, lots of different scenarios they play in very different ways which is surprising because sometimes one would think of Hoplite like Warfare as tactically uninteresting. Something that is super interesting is that this set has the largest scenario in the Great Battles of History system, the Battle Plateau that is played over several maps that need to be placed adjacent to one another. As you can see, this is the monster game for the series so far. So you select the scenario, select the map, and then you set up the game according to the instructions. The units that are featured in this group are divided in three main groups. You have overall commanders, such as this one. They are rated for three things. Range of command, initiative, and charisma. Then you have formation commanders, which have range and uh, capability. And then you have combat units. Uh, combat units are divided in formations that are color-coded to tell you who commands them, which formation commander controls which, and units need to be in range of their formation commander to be able to operate at full capability. Combat units are rated for troop quality, which is the number on the left, and movement. They have also a letter indication telling you the type of unit that it is, like hoplites or peltas in this case. Also some units uh, have range capability, in which case they have a small letter on their identification letters uh, telling you what type of range unit, of range weapon they have. Here we have javelins, you can also have regular bows, composite bows, that's ki that kind of thing. The game uses a cheat pool activation system, that means that each side will have a pool of activation cheats corresponding to the uh, commands, the formations that they have on the board. 
During the turn, you will draw uh, cheats randomly from a common cup to determine which player and which formation of the active player will get to activate. However, at the beginning of each turn, one of the players may get initiative, so both players roll a die, they add the the initiative rating of their commander and the player with the highest total gets to choose one of their available activation cheats and gets to activate that first. So gets to choose the one that they need the group that goes next. All the other activation cheats of both players are placed in a common opaque pot, uh, cup and then they are drawn randomly to determine which units activate. Each side also has a momentum activation chat. When that is drawn, you can choose one of your formation commanders and you may try to activate that. Uh, it doesn't matter if the commander activated already or not. If the uh, momentum is successful, you, you get to activate that commander twice in a turn. In order to be successful with the momentum marker, you need to roll a die and to roll equal to or less than the uh, effectiveness, the capability of the formation commander that you're trying to activate. So players will draw chits from the cup and activate the corresponding commanders. Uh, there is an extra procedure though, an extra option which is called trumping. When a chit belonging to the opponent is drawn, you may try to uh, trump the initiative of the opponent. If you declare that you're taking that option, then you need to roll a die and you roll equal to you need to roll equal to or less than the um, initiative rating of your commander. If you manage to do so, if you're successful, then your overall commander can activate one of his formation commanders within command range, and that formation commander in turn can activate units that are controlled by, by him. If the trumping is not successful, then the opponent gets to activate his formation as normal uh, and also, in addition to that, the opponent will get to use his momentum marker twice that turn. Once one of your commanders is activated, units belonging to that command get to activate. They can do different things based on whether they are within command range of their formation commander or not. And once you activate a formation commander, you issue orders to your units. There are restrictions as to what orders can be issued in combination with which ones, but that is how you determine the actions that your combat units will be performing. Very common orders are to move and or to missile fire with units that have range attack capabilities. Also another common action is to try to recover, that is to try to remove uh, cohesion hits from your units, I'll explain later what those are. Also rallying, your units may be routed and trying to rally is another thing that you'll be doing. I don't know how often you will, it depends on how you're playing, but it's something that you may want to do from time to time. Now, the most common action uh, is to move and or to missile fire. Units that are activated for movement move up to their full movement allowance. Uh, they spend movement points based on the terrain that they are crossing. Certain types of terrain may also cause cohesion hits. This is a very important concept in the game. There is a plethora of situations that will cause cohesion hits on your, on your units. Sometimes the cohesion hits are given by default. In many cases, you have to take a check. And when you're taking a check, you roll a die, a d10, and you're trying to roll equal to or less than the cohesion of your army, of your unit. If you're successful in that check, then sometimes nothing happens. If you fail, then you get cohesion hits. And when you get cohesion hits, then you simply use one of these numerical markers and you place it on the unit. When a unit reaches a number of cohesion hits that is equal to or higher than its overall cohesion, then things are bad. In many cases the unit will route. There are certain types of units that get a chance of not routing even when they are reaching their uh, cohesion total. They roll a die, they take a check and that determines whether they actually route or not. Routed units will get a routed marker, and they will start, uh, and they will start running towards the edge of the border, trying to get the heck out of there. And uh, 
elim and that's one way in which you win the game not by have by having your units run out of the board but by having enough units of the opponent to do precisely so this is how you win the game by inflicting routing damage on the opponent now back to us you move and when you move you may or may not take cohesion points up some units um, as you can see are pretty large or larger than average and those are the hoplites there are specific rules uh, when it comes to pivoting your units because units in general have to keep uh, a clear orientation units are always facing uh, vertex so one of the you know, axes in which they are and they need to spend movement points to pivot and then they can move in one of their front hexes units have indeed three types of of hexes around them the two facing them frontally are the front hex in which they can move in which they can attack then you have the flank hexes and the rear hexes different effects apply to different hexes especially when you're attacking through an X uh, or being attacked to say a flank or the rear so units move uh, spending movement points to pivot in order to move they enter their front hexes hoplites are very interesting because this game stresses the fact that with the exception of Spartan hoplites uh, who knew what they were doing uh, Hoplites in general were not very professional, so it stresses the fact that non-professional hoplites are somewhat unpredictable. As you can see, they have a movement factor printed there, which is a default for movement points. But when you're activating your hoplites the first time, you're just giving a general order, which is pretty much just go, go towards the opponent. Once you give that order, these hoplites won't be able to do much else until they uh, make contact with the opponent. So when you're activating your hoplites for the first time, each time that you activate a hoplite unit for the first time, you roll on the hoplite advanced to combat table for each unit and you determine um, if the unit is going to walk or trot or to run. Once you made the determination you place the corresponding marker on that unit. That marker will influence the behavior of the unit until the unit makes contact with the opponent. Once that happens the marker is removed and the unit then is not subjected to these restrictions. Units, uh, hoplite units that are walking have a movement allowance of three, so they're going f slow, but at least they ignore terrain cohesion hits because they can absorb uh, potential damage that will come from terrain. If they're trotting, the movement allowance is standard and they have no other effects, so it's pretty much just default. If they're running, they move fast. They get a bonus in their initial shock combat because of the momentum that they gain, but alas, they must <coughs> make uh, checks after each move to see if they're able to keep moving without damage or if they take cohesion hits. Uh, that means that uh, hoplite units that are running, well, you really want to get them to the opponent fast so they, they can attack with some good momentum before they completely fall apart simply because they have failed too many <coughs> hits, or in any case, uh, before they get too weak to really um, be able to stand their ground when they make contact with the opponent. Also, these units, uh, once they're given a, an advanced marker, as I said, they're not really subtle in their behavior, so they are subjected to the Hellenic Law of Inertia, that's the way it is called in the game. It simply means that once they have one of these markers, they need to spend their full movement allowance to move towards the enemy. They really cannot do anything but to blindly follow their order and try to make contact with the opponent. As I said, these restrictions are lifted once the unit does make contact with the opponent. Units that are capable of range attack also can, well, can do so. They can use their range attack. To resolve range attacks, you roll a die and you modify the result based on several possible modifiers. A very important one is fire versus armor. And to find the uh, correct modifier, you cross-reference the type of firing weapon that you are using with the target type. And that tells you if there is a modifier that you need to apply on that. As said, the modifiers are possible. Then you simply compare the result uh, with uh, the uh, 
possible effects on this table, you use the line corresponding to the weapon that you're using, you cross-reference with the range in excess at which you're fired, if your modified result is equal to or less than the number for that weapon at that range, then inflict a cohesion hit on the opponent. After movement in or fire has been resolved, you have shock combat. Hooray! That's always fun. Units that uh, um, shock that are in shock combat, well, they may have to take a check at the beginning of the shock combat to see if uh, they take some cohesion hits preliminary. First, the attacker may have to take uh, such a check, uh, depending on situation on the board, on various conditions. Then the defender may have to take that check. Now, units may be still engaged in combat from previous turns, in which case the defender that already, that already is engaged doesn't have to take that pre-shock combat check by units that were just attacked by the opponent and that they are defending need to take that check. This check again is standard, roll a die, compare the uh, quality with the quality of the unit that you're checking for, if you roll equal to or less then you're fine, if you roll above then you take cohesion hits. After you have potentially taken checks for the attackers and the defenders in shock combat, you finally get to resolve the shock combat. In a shock combat, first you look at the comparative weapon system charts that will tell you the column that you will use on the actual combat table. If you have uh, an attacker which is a hoplite and is attacking skirmishers, then you use line 13. Heavy infantry, attacking heavy infantry, 7. You simply cross-reference attacker with defender to find the column that you will use here. Then the general idea is that you roll a die, you, com you use the column that you just determine, you read the result here of your die roll after possibly applying modifiers, and the result will be the number of cohesion hits that are taken by the attacker and the defender respectively. The number in brackets is the number of cohesion hits that the defender receives. But there are wrinkles to this. Uh, one very important is numerical advantages. You have a modification on the column, which can be of two columns to the right or two columns to the left, depending on the side that has numerical advantage. For each attacking, additional attacking unit more than the defender, two columns to the right. For each attacking, additional defending unit, then it's columns that you shift to the left. Other things, terrain modifiers, uh, terrain also may modify the column that you're using. Die roll modifiers, when you're rolling, the overall commander, the formation commander uh, may land the modifiers, the uh, hoplites that are running and they, they are attacking the opponent may get modifiers, there are modifiers for defending units, hoplite units in locked shield wall formation, that's an option that you have to place your units in such a formation. Another important thing is superiority. I explained to you the default result of the shock combat. You read that number, you apply that damage to the units that took that damage, but that number may be modified by superiority if one of the sides has it. First you check to see if there is superiority based on position. The attacker may receive a position superiority based on, on, on the position. For example, if the attacker is attacking through the rear or flanks of the opponent. If there is no superiority based on position, then you look at the stable, the shock superiority chart, and you see if one of the sides gains, super, gains a superiority based on the types of weapons involved. You look at the attacker type, cross-reference with the defender type, and it may be the no side has superiority, or the, or the defender has superiority, or the attacker has superiority. What does it mean? It means that you resolve your combat normally every time, but when you're reading the result, if no side has superiority, then you simply apply the printed damage to the opponent, adding markers, so this result would read as three 
N2. But if one of the sides has superiority, the numerical result is modified. If the attacker is superior, you double the defender's result. If the defender is superior, you triple let that sink in for a moment. You triple the attacker's result. If the defender is not shock capable, then and some units have the penalty, then you have the result for the attacker. There is a lot more to the system than what I covered in my review slash overview. If I were to film a complete instructional video, that would be too long. In any case, I don't think that is the best way to learn a system with uh, medium slash high level of complexity such as this one. Manageable, but clearly the best way to learn the game is to simply breeze through the rules, so to set up one of the scenarios and then to reread the rules as you need them as you are uh, proceeding through the turn structure. Uh, I wanted to give you a general sense, general flavor, a hint of what the game has to offer. And what the game has to offer is a lot. When you add all of the other details that I left out, when you add units that behave in different ways in different circumstances, when you have other formations that are possible, such as the column, when you have certain maneuvers, certain options, certain reactions, there are ways in which you can react to an opponent is approaching to try to refuse contact with that opponent. A lot of these things. Uh, among the things that are really uh, core to the system that you cannot do without, uh, some of these maneuvers, you can just, the first time that you play uh, the book, not use them, which is scenarios that do not use certain maneuvers. So you do not have to use all the tactical options uh, as you learn the core rules uh, and then you add the tactical options later. But the among the core things, so there is the shock system, which somehow the way it was presented in the rule, uh, in the rules, so I had a little bit of, uh, I don't say it was trouble, but it took me a little bit to really absorb it and to figure it out. Before I realized that the, uh, in reality it is pretty sim simple. You check if you need uh, to take a shock check, uh, a cohesion check before you resolve shock combat. Then you find the column that you need to use, roll the die, apply modifiers, see the result, and attack uh, defender superiority, you can check it later in case it is not obvious. But after you play it a little bit, you just look at the situation on the board and you do not need to go through the procedure to determine if one of the sides has superiority. And once the system, which is pretty simple, find the column, roll, apply modifiers, see if the uh, damage is modified by superiority. Once you have it down, the system is very rewarding because it does manage to uh, factor in a lot of complexity, a lot of historical detail, a lot of chrome in, um, in what is, after all, a pretty uh, easy and uh, manageable system to resolve. Uh, the overall flow and flavor of the game is something that I enjoy. It's really nice to see how uh, you have this battle, that you look at the uh, setup and everything looks so clean, and then things start being so messy. Uh, because you can see how the cohesion of the units degrades over time. That doesn't have an immediate effect, it just tells you how close a unit is to break, but then when the unit breaks, then you have people that are running uh, on the board. You have commanders that uh, uh, have tough decisions at that point. This is something common to uh, all games uh, that have to do with medieval and ancient warfare in which you actually and physically see the units moving on the board as they're trying to leave the board and then the commander has to choose uh, between staying in the main lines and, and having his units act effectively or start to run after the routing units to try to rally them before it is too late. And considering that the victory here is based on routing points, clearly that is a particularly tough decision. You may uh, say the situation presently because you prevent your units from bleeding too many routing points in the leaderboard, but on the other hand, there is uh, you're not being as effective in the first lines. Uh, chaos. So chaos comes from this when you start having gaps in the lines. And there is a certain um, really enjoyable degree of chaos that comes from the fact that hoplite units are so unpredictable. 
by stressing the uh, low level of competence on many hoplite units, the game makes uh, the situation very interesting from the point of view of, of gameplay. Because you have this neat line of hoplites at the beginning of the game, and then some people start running, some trotting, some are left behind because they're just walking at their own pace. The lines break, uh, attacks happen a little uh, earlier, a little uh, later, as opposed to when you like them to happen, and you have to cope with this. You have the units running around the hoplites trying to uh, figure out ways of, of saving the situation from the, um, from the incompetence of so many hoplite units. If you're trying to move your hoplite units multiple times in a turn, there is another rule uh, that says that hoplite units tend to drift to the right um, because they were covering themselves uh, with the shields on the left, and then it seems there's enough evidence to, uh, to assume that then they would tend to drift to the right as we're trying to keep the opponent on the left. There is a rule to, si to simulate that. I can tell you about the level of details, uh, of detail that you have in the design in general, and to tell you about all of the things that have been uh, wired around the Hoplite units to make these units interesting to play and to give you enough crown to make this game feel like very really much its own thing. I think this game does a good job of taking Hoplit Warfare and turning it into a successful, enjoyable war game experience. A uh, lot of historical detail in the rules, a lot of historical detail in the scenario book, a lot of scenarios to play. You have the monster game of the, of the Platea battle. Uh, I think this is an excellent set. I haven't played many sets uh, in the Great Battles of History um, system, but this is one that is really highly enjoyable and also absolutely good value for the money because I think you can really play for a long time with the scenarios that you find in this box. Also, the game is absolutely uh, friendly to solitaire players who just want to play both sides at the best of their possibilities. Thanks to the level of unpredictability that is brought by the uh, the different pace at which the output units uh, travel, and also uh, thanks to the activation system, over which you can have some control thanks to the uh, the trumping attempt and the initiative attempt, but there is enough fog war and unpredictability to keep the situation fresh and interesting if you're playing against yourself. Trust me, this is not like playing chess against yourself. You can only see ahead. Uh, so far when you do not know exactly when your units are activating. Hoplet by GMT. A very good addition to the Great Battles of History system and definitely a very good game in its own.